Welcome everyone to the Diatom Web Academy brought to you by the Diatom Taxonomic Certification Committee of the Society for Freshwater Science and Diatoms of North America at diatoms.org. You can check out the news page on diatoms.org for the list of webinar speakers lined up for this year. You can also watch recordings on our YouTube channel. If you're interested in participating as a speaker, we want to hear from you. Please contact any of the Web Academy organizers. Our next webinar is on February 2nd by Melissa Vaccarino. Um, by popular demand, the topic is Diatoms 101. And today we have Mark Edland who will introduce our speaker and Sarah Spaulding, who will lead the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So Mark, uh, please go ahead. All right, thanks, Sylvia. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, a longtime friend of mine, uh, Becky Bixby, who's coming to us from New Me University of New Mexico. Um, Becky is in, on the research faculty in the Department of Biology and also in the Museum of Southwest Biology at, at the university there. And she's also the associate director of the interdisciplinary water resources program at the University of New Mexico. Um, Becky got her PhD um, a little bit after I did at, at uh, University of Michigan from Jean Stormer. And from that time, she's, she's actually focused quite a bit uh, on stream biology and in particularly looking at biodiversity and ecosystem structure in low light environments. And this has taken her, um, I wanna say all over the world, all over the Western hemisphere with uh, working in the Western Appalachians, Costa Rica and New Mexico to study these uh, very um, special stream systems that are where the diatom production is controlled by light. So Becky, thanks for joining us for the Diatom Web Academy today and the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I know this is um, probably first day of classes for some people at universities, um, so I'm glad you could come. Um, as Mark said, I've been working in low light systems um, since my postdoc. My postdoc was at Georgia, and I worked in rainforests of Costa Rica, where light was limited. Um, and as several side projects, I worked in the Western Appalachians at Coweta Long-Term Ecological Research Site. Um, working in headwater streams there. Uh, now that I'm at New Mexico, I'm working at arid land rivers, which are limited in light in a different way with suspended particles in the water. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a little bit happenstance that I um, have been working on these really interesting low light environments. Um, and so today I just want to talk about this role of light availability and how it shapes diatom assemblages. Um, it's focusing on two sort of vignettes, um, one looking at riparian cover and one looking at these suspended particles. So it's sort of a two part talk. So Light availability, the importance of it is, is pretty obvious to those of us who work in photo, with photosynthesizers. Um, I would say that it's also especially relevant to assessment, where light can be a major driver in how these communities, um, who's, who the members are and how they um, respond to light. And often in, this, in assessments, that this this parameter of light availability is not included. There are species specific to species specific responses to light levels, although it's not particularly well documented in the literature. And as I mentioned, it can be a major driver for ecosystem structure and algal assemblages. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on lodic systems, streams and rivers, um, both uh, headwater systems and also fifth, sixth, seventh order street of uh, rivers. Um, there are lots of examples of light issues and light availability questions in the research for lakes, um, but I'm not really going to focus on that today. So as a reminder, photosynthesis is critical or sorry, light is super important, critical for photosynthesis. 
And, and the range that we think about is the photosynthetically active radiation range, also termed PAR, and you'll see that in graphs today that I show. As a reminder, that's the visible range between um, red and violet. And, uh, and if you forget, you can always look at the, what the queen is wearing. She's always wearing clothes in that PAR range, the full range of PAR. So I think of light availability being controlled by two factors. And these are not exclusive. Um, the first is riparian canopy cover. And uh, that is changes in terrestrial vegetation that may affect, um, that may affect uh, light reaching the, the stream. And this first vignette I'll talk about today is about riparian canopy cover. Uh, the second factor that may be in play is the suspended particles in the water itself. Um, that can be sediment, that can be algal cells, um, it can be um, tannins and humics. So, uh, and also those particles can affect algal communities with depth. So if you look at this uh, diagram, this diagram up here from a, a commonly used freshwater ecology textbook, the riparian canopy cover really affects how much incident light is coming into the stream and the suspended particles really affect this transmission or the light attenuation that happens within the water column itself. So these are two factors I'm talking about today. I'm not really talking about the idea of self-shading so this is a, a pond near our house that clearly, clearly has some uh, bloom issues. Um, you can think about the cells shading each other out. And some of that idea is in play in both of these uh, ideas of canopy cover and suspended particles. Uh, but I'm really not gonna directly talk about self-shading today. So how do you measure the effects of light availability on diatom assemblages? So there are four main things, more, four main parameters that you might use. Um, the first is biomass. Um, and that's, you know, sort of a first line of defense and thinking about it. And that may be as chlorophyll A or maybe as cell densities. Um, chlorophyll A, which some of us sort of makes us kind of growl because it's often the easy way to measure algae and pretty coarse measurement. But chlorophyll A can actually change with light availability. In low light environments, the chlorophyll A may be more concentrated per cell, but if you actually measure the biovolume, which would give you an idea of, of the sort of 3D nature of the community, um, you find that the, the cell numbers or the cell biovolume actually hasn't changed. So this chlorophyll A can be an interesting parameter to look at uh, in, in looking at light availability. Um, the second parameter may be taxonomic composition and species richness. Species richness tends to be lower in lower light environments. And there are certainly taxa that are characteristic of these low light environments. Although I would argue, um, we don't know as much about it as I assumed we would when I dug into the literature. A third metric you might look at are growth form traits. And there are a number of, of um, papers that have come out recently that have really articulated this kind of classification. Uh, one by Ramey and Bouchard and another one by Passy and, and Larson that really um, separated different genera by their growth forms and allowed a kind of a classification. So this di diagram down here on the left is actually meant for grazing pressure, but it works for light as well. You can see that in low light environments, you might have this low um, prostrate community. And as you increase with light, you have more stalked and more erect different, uh, more erect genera. This diagram here on the right is some work that I did with a colleague while I was at Georgia postdocing, looking at uh, pasture and forested communities in Madagascar. And these are non-metric multidimensional scaling 
diagrams and they're grouped. Each one of these boxes is a different growth form. The dark circles scaled by cell, cell density size. So the bigger the circle, the higher the densities. Um, the dark ones are the forested sites and the, and the open circles are the open canopy sites. And you can see that different growth forms have different responses to this change in light availability. So the stalked diatoms are much more common in open canopy sites and the prostrate and solitary cells are much more common in the, in the forested sites. This growth form work um, kind of predated this work um, that's been published. And so I had to spend a lot of time thinking about what I knew about diatoms and spending some time looking at wet mounts to see how they potentially have been growing. The fourth parameter you might consider in looking at light availability is biovolume. Biovolume is the 3D measurements of cells. And there are a lot of caveats that go with it. There can be an enormous amount of variation um, in measuring biovolumes. And it's also a lot of work. But sometimes it can be important in studies that are looking at light availability and also in grazing, avail um, grazing experiments. So for example, if you have a series of cells that you count simply by density, you would have five cells for the smaller uh, hypothetical genus and five cells for this larger hypothetical genus. But if you measure the biovolume of this small cells and you know that it's 50 mi uh, cubic micrometers per cell, that gives you a biovolume of 250. And if you compare that to the larger cells that may have a larger biovolume, you would have 500 cubic micrometers per millimeter squared. So you may be losing some information by counting only densities and that you might benefit from seeing changes um, by measuring the biovolumes. And you'll see some biovolume data in some of the slides I'm gonna show. I, I'd add that some of the biovolume uh, Bibles <laughs> are uh, this Hildenbrand et al. paper, which has a lot of the geometric formulas that you need to calculate biovolumes, and that the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia website at the Patrick Center has an amazing spreadsheet of biovolumes, lot, uh, huge uh, sample numbers. Um, that can give you the biovolumes of different different species and that's been phenomenally helpful in utilizing this kind of parameter. So I want to start with one vignette about riparian canopy cover. Um, this is just a gratuitous picture of a kid, <laughs> my kid, um, at a site that we're monitoring uh, up near Taos in northern New Mexico that has uh, Didymos phenia in it, interestingly. Uh, this is the only open area in this little creek called Rio Ando. Um, if you move downstream, it's really, really shaded. So this uh, really lovely headwater stream and many headwater streams look exactly like this or more shaded. So riparian canopy cover uh, can be useful in assessing impacts of things like land use change. So changes from forest to um, agriculture or pasture land. It can be useful in assessing the impacts of timber harvest. This is a project I've been working on with some colleagues at Oregon State looking at timber harvest and how changes in timber, pra timber harvest practices leaving buffer zones can affect algal communities. This is the day we were there sampling and it was super uh, fogged in. Um, and another impact you might be measuring is the impact of a keystone species die off. And I'll spend some time talking about this. Um, this is a hemlock, eastern hemlock that's been decimated by the hemlock woolly adelgid and has really changed how the riparian structure um, is in headwater streams in the eastern seaboard of the United States. To measure canopy cover, it could be as simple as using a spherical densiometer, which gives you uh, a measure of canopy cover by percentage. That's the simplest. Um, 
way to measure. You could also measure hemispherical photos. So these are some of the photos from that Oregon project that I just mentioned, looking at changes in canopy cover. Uh, and that gives you a, a, pro, uh, a better resolution in um, what the canopy cover and light, light availability might be. And certainly there are lots of sensors that will really actually measure the light that's coming into Um, to measure cover, you're actually measuring light. So I want to present a, a number of um, pieces of, of uh, information about headwater streams in Appalachians. Um, the Appalachians are in the southeastern United States, it includes the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, where Rex Lau, Paula Fury, and uh, Pat Kaselik have worked. Uh, and the work that I'm talking about today is more focused further to the east at the Coweta Long-Term Ecological Research Site, where there's been a lot of work through the last 30 years um, looking at how algal communities are, are impacted um, in these headwater streams. You know, we talk about the Appalachians, but a lot of this work can easily be uh, translated to stream, headwater streams in Oregon or headwater streams um, in, in many mountainous areas. So the first um, work that was really done at Coweta Long-Term Ecological Research Site, which is part of a national forest, was work that was done by Rex Lau in the mid 80s. And he looked at the effect of canopy cover um, in, in a stream that was a uh, clear cut um, versus a stream that was actually still forested in a reference site. And I just wanted to start with this because this is uh, for a bunch of reasons, really, uh, really important work that really set sort of the stage for how we understand how these systems work. On the left are a list of taxa that are found uh, in the reference site. So acnanthes, a number of eunoshas that really are sort of the quintessential taxa you find in these low light systems. Eunosha exigua, eunosha rhomboidea, um, meridian circulari, uh, humidophila contenta, and tetracyclus. And we see these in all sorts of streams around this region. Um, and it's sort of classic taxa that you find in these reference sites. You compare that to these sites, uh, these taxa that are found in the clear cut stream, which is uh, much more diverse, uh, higher species richness, and also includes a couple of greens. This diagram, I use this diagram for teaching Paraphyton 101 all the time, where he's got um, these different types of growth forms highlighted in a nice um, cartoon. This is the pie diagram for the clear cut stream and you can see that it's really dominated by uh, erect taxa and filamentous taxa. This is the reference site here on the right where he still has um, actually more erect taxa but a lot more prostrate taxa. So the assumption is that with more light you have maybe a, a a more complex biofilm and also um, more upright or upper canopy taxa. So this really set the stage for the work that um, continues to, to go on at Coweta. And, and one of the interesting things is there is an enormous number of endemic taxa to the Appalachians. And I expect, although we've not really truly tested it, that a lot of these taxa are low light adapted. Paula Fury has done a ton of work in the Appalachians looking at eunoshas, lots of these, the diversity of eunoshas in the Appalachians is astonishing. Um, and this is a, so this is one described from the Smokies and we find it in the, in the, in Western North Carolina as well. And Meridian Alan Smithii was described by Lynn Brandt I expect that the Meridian Circulari and Rex's diagram in part encompasses this really neat Meridian that we find in these low light environments. So we've got Rex's work that shows the difference between uh, low light and high light environments. 
And we think about these streams as being low nutrient as well. And often I think low light and some other parameters sort of rolled into the explanation of why the systems are the way they are. And so um, this is work done by Jennifer Greenwood for her PhD at Georgia, where she was really looking at the role of nutrients, which in many cases should be like the major driver. Um, and in fact, in these low light streams, light is really the master driver. So these are four different taxa found commonly in these headwater streams. And what she's done is enriched it at this time point here with nitrate, uh, nitrate and phosphate. And she's looked to see if it really stimulated any kind of change in relative biovolume in any of these taxa. So the filled in circles are the, are the treatment and the open circles are the reference sites. And you can see across the board, these lines are really in synchrony, not entirely, but pretty much across the board, nutrients really haven't stimulated any changes in biovolume in any different, in any taxa of diatom. Um, and what they point out is that there's probably changes in light availability and there's also changes um, in grazing pressure in these systems. So it's interesting that this light upon it. This is a project involved in as the one of the algal people. Uh, these are this is another non-metric multi-dimensional site and a series of samples. Um, and the two reference sites, the super shaded sites with 86% canopy cover, only had 24 species, these Coeta and Avery sites and dominated by a number of the tax that we've been talking about already this morning. And these sites are very different than these sites. This is the, the three sites we have that are um, indicative of changing landscape towards agriculture. And these sites here are more indicative or are, are sort of predicted to be sites that are more suburbanizing, less canopy cover, and more species. So even at a landscape level scale, these forested sites are really different than these open canopy sites and sites with different land use. You can see this is a type of a cluster diagram and the Coeta and Avery sites are very much removed from the rest of the sites in terms of their uh, cluster analysis. They're really different. So this is a this is a fun paper to work on because it also involved uh, invertebrates and fish and and the signals were really similar. So the last part of this vignette I want to talk about is some ongoing work with Kelsey Solomon, who's a PhD student almost finished at the University of Georgia. When I was at Georgia, one of the projects I worked on um, was a baseline study to look at streams that we thought were going to be impacted by this hemlock woolly adelgid. Hemlock woolly adelgid has decimated the hemlocks along riparian uh, systems and along headwater streams along the eastern seaboard of the United States really started in the north. So there's lots of documentation in Massachusetts and um, northern areas and it's mo moved through the south um, in the mid 2000s. And so one of the projects I did was I went out and just collected the baseline data um, concerning the algae in these systems before the hemlock died out. What has happened is that the hemlock has now died out and has been taken over by this understory of rhododendron, which is a, which is an evergreen, um, but has really changed in some ways the light levels that are available. So Kelsey came in and has followed up on that original pre-die-off 
um, study and followed up with the post die off study. So this is one of the diagrams from one of her chapters um, for her dissertation. These are again non-metric multi-dimensional scaling diagrams and you can see that the communities have changed. This is a January sampling and a September sampling. The communities have changed um, from pre to post die off in both cases. And in January, there's a huge amount of variation um, when hemlock is available. And she thinks that this is probably related to changes in light availability that are um, causing more, availab more avail light availability uh, and changes in the community um, versus this post die off where the rhododendron is quite close to the stream itself. It's, it's very much an understory plant. So that really may change uh, what light can get through. The second graph of hers shows the change in bio volumes. So here is uh, pre hemlock die off and post hemlock die off. And this is um, bio volume. And you can see that there is a change in bio volume in both seasons, pre and post die off. And she attributes that to the loss of, uh, of a couple of really large uh, eunotias that are no longer as prevalent in the system. But you can also see the relative bio volume by growth form and that it really hasn't changed all that much. So sort of swapping out a, a, a tree that shades with an understory that shades. So these systems are really still lacking um, in, in light. One of the things that Kelsey and I have been talking about a lot is this work that's coming out of Dana Warren's lab at Ohio State, uh, not Ohio State, Oregon State, who works at H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest uh, in Oregon. And they're really interested in this idea of light flex. And these are light flex from a picture in Costa Rica. But you can see from this diagram, this is time on the x-axis and light availability par on the, on the y-axis. In the open canopy stream, you can see this is what the light should look like throughout the day. And in shaded areas, you can see that there are little blips of light sometimes almost approaching a full light day um, throughout the year, uh, throughout the day. Um, these bars represent changes in temperature. So this is the maximum temperature here in dark gray and um, within two degrees in the lighter gray. They're really interested in cutthroat trout. And so that's why they were interested in um, thinking about how the temperatures might change. So you can see throughout the day, uh, you can imagine that the diacom community could get little blips of light that would help it with its photosynthesis. This is a second paper that's come out of this group where they uh, manipulated the light. So they took an open canopy site and added shade to it. Um, their methods change from year to year. So they've actually graphed this as a ratio, but you can see that the light has decreased. And as you might expect, the chlorophyll A, which is how they're referring to, to algae, has also decreased. And this moves all the way up the food chain. If you decrease light, it, it travel, it uh, magnifies up the food chain. So invertebrates, trout, young of the year fish and salamanders are also impacted by this lack of light. So that's sort of a summary of some ideas of riparian cover. The other the other topic I want to talk about is this idea of suspended particles, which really is kind of the subject of a lot of the research in my lab right now. So you can have low suspended particles. It's my feet at the Beaver Island North American Diatom Symposium meeting several years ago, and my grubby chacos uh, st standing, um, standing in the Rio Grande where there is still suspended particles, but this is actually a pretty good day where there isn't that much uh, suspended particles in the water. So I'm focused really on arid land rivers, uh, but there's certainly a number of scenarios where um, suspended particles could really impede uh, light attenuation and transmission. So arid land rivers have variable flows, 
they often have really high turbidity that's related to air land erosion and tributary contributions. So we work in the middle of Rio Grande, which is located, um, the river runs through Albuquerque. The, uh, the river originates in Colorado and actually goes into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we're in an area where there's a lot of, um, well, it's relatively dry. Well, it's very dry actually. Um, and, and has a very um, distinctive climatic pattern. So it's called the big river if you translate it from Spanish. And sometimes it looks like this. Um, and sometimes it looks like this. We have pretty impressive summer dry down, um, both related to climate um, and also related to a lot of water policy and water compacts. Um, it's the most managed system I've ever worked in, in terms of how, who gets what and uh, water rights. So this is a diagram from a postdoc I've been working with who's interested in gross primary production. She's been taking a lot of the USGS uh, gauge data and graphed it. So this is a, a whole bunch of gears. Um, and what I really just want you to look at is this is this is January to December on the x-axis. Discharge turbidity measured on the y-axis. And you can see um, we have a huge snow melt pulse in the spring. And you can see, you know, not every year is great. Uh, some years are crazy high and some years um, there's not a lot of snow melt at all. But our discharge really is um, is high or can be high through, um, I'd say March through June. If you look at the turbidity, the turbidity is really driven by monsoonal rains that happen in July, August, and September. And so you can see generally there are spikes in turbidity in the, in the summer. So high flows in the spring, high turbidity in the, in the summer. And you can see from these pictures, you know, there's sort of a variation in, in turbidity. This was a particularly d nasty day. It's also our sites tend to have a lot of trash. So this is a, a juice jug um, filled with water from the Rio Grande being held by one of our undergrads. So if you think about this idea that it's a turbid system, the edge habitat is really important where the depth is shallow enough that the light can penetrate to the benthic algae that are growing there. So what we see is primary producers are really in this compressed habitat uh, located on the edge. And we see really low water column pr primary productivity because there's so much sediment in the water. And so this, this habitat is really restricted by that sustained turbidity Although obviously the turbidity can be variable as well. So this is some of the worst that we see. This is not too bad. Um, and this was last summer where the flows were incredibly low. And uh, this is also a site farther south of Albuquerque where we saw a pretty phenomenal bathtub ring. Oh, I gave away my punchline. So, so we often refer to this as the bathtub ring. This is a, a, a term coined by Stuart Bunn uh, who's Australian, and we often um, are using that Australian literature to understand uh, arid land systems in the in the southwest United States as well. So this bathtub ring that is uh, is located along the edges of the river. So if you think about what it might be like to hang out on the edge of the water. And if, you, if this is where that biofilm is actually growing, that benthic periphyton, light transmission is important, sediment movement is important, and the hydraulics of the system are important. Things like flow velocity, shear stress, and turbulence. How, how these parameters all shape this biofilm has really been sort of a focus in our lab. So the questions we think about are, you know, how spatially, how does this bathtub ring look in arid land rivers? And I've shown you some data that say that it's, you know, it's also not a 
static system. There's a lot of dynamics that go into this. When we think about the role of turbidity and de depth and hydraulics, discharge and sort of fine scale measures of discharge, how, do that, how does it shape that bathtub ring? One of the reasons why we're really interested in this beyond just sort of basic science is that there is a federally endangered silvery minnow we have the Rio Grande silvery minnow that lives in this river that's dependent on uh, algae to uh, as a food resource and so understanding how this bathtub ring um, is structured can be important in understanding the food resources for the silvery minnow and uh, the silvery minnow not by itself, but the programs that are that are set up to to uh, to monitor to, to monitor it um, have been important in funding some of our work. So the study sites we work on, there are two sites we're really uh, have been focused on in the last ten years. This is a site called Los Lunas that's wide floodplain, sandy. Some of the first work we did on looking at the bathtub ring were cited here. We also have these upstream sites, Santa Ana and Bernalillo, that are more silty and have a much narrower channel. Um, and this difference in substrate and channel width, um, we'll see really plays a role in what this bathtub ring looks like. So two methods or two programs with the same kinds of methods where we're doing transects from the shore out into the river and we measure at set points velocity, depth from distance from shore, depth chlorophyll A, uh, diatom taxa, and also invertebrate taxa, which I won't talk about today. Um, and so we have a protocol where we sample every five centimeters in depth or every uh, half meter in distance. Sometimes we've done it shorter distances, but we're really trying to essentially map what this bathtub ring looks like going out into the river. In the upstream sites, the Bernalillo and, and Santa Ana sites, um, that project actually added some fine scale hydraulics using an acoustic Doppler velocimeter, or as we call it, the Velociraptor. So we can get really good 3D um, measurements of velocity, turbulence, shear stress. Um, and so we measure, we measure those kinds of parameters alongside those transects. So we measure the biological parameters. So here are some of the major players in the Rio Grande. And, I, and we are in the process of really linking species to depth and species to turbidity, but some of the these are some of the major dominant taxa that we see. We see Cochineus placentula, we see Amphora pediculus, Roigosphenia abbreviata. We see this Nitsia we've been calling Paleo. Oh, Nitsia has always made me sweat. Um, we see Navicula aerofuga, very common. And in the southern side, we see Navicula rostellata. None of these really pop out in the literature as being low light indicators, but I'm not sure anyone's really looked at um, the relationship between light and these these taxa. We're more focused on headwater streams. And so this is something we've been really trying to delve into. We have a lot of data from from these projects. And so that's been an ongoing um, an ongoing uh, project for us. So if you think about that downstream site, sandy, wide channel, we, we were mapping out this transects and looking at changes in chlorophyll. And you can see there seems to be, so these are seasonal. This is uh, water depth. Each panel represents a different season. And in any given season, the depth seems to have a threshold at about 18 centimeters. You can see, especially here in the summer, and there seems to be a velocity th threshold um, at about 0.15 meters per second. 
and you can see that especially in the summer. And this is essentially, as a confession, a little bit eyeballing it. Um, we haven't had enough data to do real genuine threshold analysis, but that has been um, in the works. So we were feeling pretty confident that, you know, okay, we understand how this might work. Um, so the second, uh, and so also here, that was chlorophyll. Here are the densities and we see the same kinds of patterns, about 18 centimeters in depth and about 0.15 meters per second in terms of velocity that may sort of really drive the diatom densities. So that's a, a discharge measurement and depth as sort of a, a turbidity uh, analog. And so if we look at this upstream sites, we were feeling so confident that we understood this threshold for discharge and turbidity. These are sites, these are sites in going down, these are different transects going across. This is water depth. So essentially these are cross sections. So if this worked how we thought it might work um, for taxa richness, um, and the same for density, which I'll show you in a second. You know, the larger circles representing greater richness should be near the surface, and the smaller circles should be um, at depth, at greater depth, because you have less light, lower species richness. Uh, and the fact is that it hasn't really worked that way. In some cases, it's the same all the way down with depth. Um, sometimes it's actually greater at depth. And so we have this uh, far more complex story than we expected um, for tax richness. So this is 2016, 2017. One of the interesting things this shows, I mean, this is really, these lines are really showing the geomorphology. You can see that these, no, um, from year to year, the the stream profile is changing dramatically. We had a huge undercutting event. And so this became um, almost impossible to sample because it was straight down from the bank. So we have this changing morphology as well. One interesting thing to point out is that season seems to be important. Depth, maybe not that important statistically, but if you have depth and season, things may actually be important. So, sampling at different seasons may mean that depth is more or less important. Here's the density, same kind of story. Um, one would assume the densities would be higher at the surface and smaller at the depth. And sometimes that works at transects and sometimes it doesn't. Like this example here where it's, there's a lot more dense, at, it's, it's a more dense community cell more cells per millimeter squared um, at depth than at the surface. So we're, we're kind of at this interesting point where we're trying to tease out how, how we can predict what the bath covering would look like. So these thoughts that we've been having um, and how to proceed, we're we're at the end of a four-year project and we really are working on synthesizing all this data together. Um, the depth alone really doesn't drive those diatom parameters uh, predictably. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so we're interested in this role of hydraulics and how that might shape it. Uh, and so we've been fiddling around with these classification and regression trees. You may know them as CART, which allows us to incorporate uh, hydraulic variables like shear stress and turbulence with changes in the biological communities. And we have been working on it with both the diatom and invertebrate data. It's not really quite ready for prime time, but I have a, I am confident that this might help tease apart um, these drivers. And the second thing is this relationship between turbidity and light attenuation and depth. And so we've been going out and measuring depth and what the light looks like. This is log 
log of light here on the y-axis. This is in a, a lower turbidity environment and a higher turbidity environment. And you can see the slope's a little different. Ideally, what we'd like to have is a, a relationship between turbidity and light intensity so that we may be able to predict what depth is that compensation point? Like where is there not, where is the light so limited that photosynthesis um, can't occur? And so we can think about kind of created the edges of what that bathtub ring could be in any given situation. So having this relationship that um, allows us to not go through measuring everything, but uh, understanding with the turbidity level this is where the depth, uh, the maximum depth of that uh, bathtub ring might be. So that um, really sums up this second vignette of, of suspended particles in rivers. And, and again, I'm sure that some of this actually applies to other systems. So sort of a call to action and the, the knowledge gaps that I see. I think we really need a better understanding of species level adaptation. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of this is here, this is there, but really have not, um, we've really not articulated it uh, in a way that really could be helpful in understanding communities and low light systems the relationship between light availability and other drivers, nutrients discharge, turbidity, is also surprisingly not well understood, especially in systems with a suspended sediment. Um, and our data from the Rio Grande also highlights this idea of seasonality and how it plays a part in the story um, in terms of driving turbidity levels and how it may drive discharge. Uh, and my call to action is that we actually think about including light measurements in assessments because I think we're, we don't do that very often and it seems a little bit like a no-brainer but I think we don't and I think it may help um, help us understand a lot of the data that we do generate um, in monitoring and assessments. And with that um, highlighted a number of big um, funding sources, the Forest Service and the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, the Bureau of Rec Reclamation has funded a lot of our work in the Rio Grande. Um, and the Coweta work is funded through the long-term ecological research site through the National Science Foundation. Uh, I've included my email if you have any questions, if something comes up that you'd like to talk about after today. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Becky. And if there are no questions, I'm going to take all the rest of the time because <laughs> I have a ton of questions. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to follow up with you. I see um, Mark has one coming in in the chat. Uh, suspended sediment is often a rapidly changing stream factor. How are algal communities adapted to rapid rapidly respond to changes in suspended solids, both positively and negatively? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, so our work does not actually address things at that scale. Um, I think in systems that regularly receive um, high loads of so, so we measure turbidity. Turbidity is a measure of water clarity. It's not it is, uh, it's an analog for suspended solids. Uh, and that might be the thing to measure. In our, in our sites where we know we get a lot of sediment, we see a lot of epipelic diatoms. And so, you know, on a long-term basis, there may be changes that are evident by, you know, changes in things like change, uh, increasing epipelic diatoms. On a short term, um, Basis. I mean, you may see effects of, um, you know, increased sedimentation, decreased populations because they've been swamped out. 
Uh, and I don't actually know, you know, in a positive way where you might see that other than you might see changes in communities. Okay. Does that answer your question? Do you have any well, thoughts? <laughs> well, while Mark's thinking about that, okay. Ariana says, thanks for an interesting talk. Um, she's wondering if you've ever done any studies on mud flat in estuaries. No, I have not. Um, there are a number of um, there are a number of projects that were done on the East Coast, but I have not worked in estuaries at all, actually. One of the things that I really struck me about your talk, Becky, is that um, you know this this bathtub rings are they elsewhere? We just don't pay so much attention to them because we're focused on um, you know sort of larger amounts of biomass in the rest of the stream but these edges are still there. Mm -hmm. I think that is probably true. Um, you know there have been stable isotope studies in Australia so this bathtub ring concept is from sort of central Australia um, and they've done stable isotope work there, also stable isotope work here that shows that the food chain, the food web um, is consuming, is consuming the algae, these benthic algal rings in the bathtub ring uh, almost exclusively at different parts of the year. So I think it's probably really common um, and you don't have to have a lot of suspended particles uh, to really, you know, restrict the light to some degree. So I think people don't sample along the edges. I mean, conventionally you go and you sample in, in the middle of the river, but in our case, there's nothing in the middle of the river. So. Right. right. Um, I have another question. Um, going back to the first part of your talk and, and woodland streams, and you talked about a lot about low light specialists but you didn't talk about heterotrophs at all. How oh. much does um, diatom's ability to switch to heterotrophy potentially play in these low light systems? And either, either whether they're um, able to work with low amounts of light or if they're taking up uh, dissolved organic carbon. Oh, I have absolutely, I have no idea. That is a really interesting question. Um, especially in these systems that are also low, low nutrient. So um, I don't know what the answer might be to that. And I don't think anyone's really looked at that and at least in the systems in Coweta. What do you, what, I mean, what, I'm gonna, what do you think about that? Have you worked in heterotrophic? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just struck by, um, mm -hmm. you know, I've been working in uh, the Pacific Northwest um, a few years ago and really impressed on me that it's a heterotrophic system, not a uh, mm -hmm. photosynthetic right. system. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say too, in all, in the large surveys that are done by USGS and EPA, canopy cover is indeed a measure that's included. So okay. anybody that's out there and interested in working with those data, um, those are largely publicly available. Um, I see Josh has a question, um, wonderful talk. What methodology do you think would best suit sweet stream assessment, uh, densiometry, hemispheric photos, PAR sensors, are they equal more or less? Well, you know, the easy thing to do is the spherical densiometer, but if you ever used one, they're, they're tricky uh, and you really have to hold them at the right angle and you have to, um, it almost works better if it's the same person measuring it every time. And so I think something a little more sophisticated, if you're really looking at light availability, um, I think something more sophisticated like hemispherical photo or 
or something that would measure par might be more more useful. Although, you know, spherical densiometers is something you can stick in your pocket and um, is the NACWA data, Sarah, spherical densiometer? Yes. Yes, okay. I mean, it's something that's easy to do in terms of like cost wise um, and, it, and it, will, it will give you a percent canopy cover. If you want something more sophisticated like light intensity, um, then you would need to use a light meter or some kind of sensor. Um, Josh says, thanks. Um, anybody else want to jump in with a question? Um, okay, I'll go then. <laughs> um, so you alluded to those, uh, the silver ray minnow being able to use those edge habitats. Um, that was really interesting. And, and so one of the things I was really wondering about is if they are in to many grazers inaccessible um, because of the shallow nature or perhaps drawing, if that's part of what uh, allows an edge habitat to take off and, and do well is it's minimally uh, consumed. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the story. Um, and we've lost a lot of the, a lot of the, um, you know, they're pelagic spawner grazers in the in the Rio Grande in general. I mean, one of the, one of the ongoing conversations about the silvery minnow is that it really likes um, it likes floodplain river channel connection. Uh, it, it's a pelagic spawner. Its eggs tend to drift. Well, its eggs drift often into inundated floodplain in the spring, and that floodplain, when it's wet, um, is a giant bathtub ring. Um, and so we find the eggs in these floodplains, and we find the larvae grazing in the floodplain. Um, and because of the way we've managed the Rio Grande, we have lost a lot of that river floodplain connection which has been an ongoing conversation. And so yeah. um, that bathtub ring has really um, become more restricted uh, because we've lost that big floodplain. We don't have a lot of wet floodplain here. So Yeah, and ecologically, we know though, these edge edges between habitats are mm -hmm. the, often the most important types of habitats. And this is a really great example mm -hmm. of that. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Meredith has a comment. Um, she says, I'm originally from Rio Rancho, New Mexico. No way! And it's fun <laughs> to see the diatom work in the state. You talked about how the Rio Grande um, fluctuates between high and low flow. And does the diversity change between those levels? And then also, have you collected diatoms that are dried up um, in the bathtub ring? from when the river was previously high. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, we do see changes um, that I think are more related to changes in turbidity more than discharge. But discharge is obviously, uh, in some cases, driving turbidity. So we do see those changes. And that's part of what we are trying to articulate with this data set that we are in the process of writing up. It's how does how do we put all those pieces together? Um, the way we sample is that we actually start not at river edge, but sort of where it's the dampest. <laughs> and so we're often sampling that bathtub ring that is uh, not got uh, actively flowing water, but it's damp. And so we are in some ways sampling things that are starting to dry. Uh, and that has been a, a, a curiosity that I've been trying to figure out how to really sample is thinking about as the river dries in this in the summer, how, how do we look at that change in community? Um, is things dry down and leave these isolated pools. And then on the flip side, how does that river, main river channel get um, 
repopulated. The system is full of ditches in this um, diversion, diversion ditches that are often wet when the river is dry. And so how do those serve as refugia? How do those, how does everything get back into that system um, when it re-wets in the fall? Okay, great, thank you. I, I just turned my video off because my internet's <laughs> um, unstable. Um, but it. we are at the top of the hour. So, um, Becky, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great to hear your talk. And thanks to everyone that uh, participated. Um, you can feel welcome to follow up with Becky. And Becky, we should chat soon. I would yes. love that. <laughs> and great. our next uh, Diatom Web Academy will be on February 2nd, I believe. Is that two weeks from now? Um, Melissa Vaccarino will be presenting a talk on Diatoms 101, which has been a often requested topic. So um, see you all then.